His, his title is Incorporating Ecological Baselines into Coral Reef Management. Thanks, Terry. <clears throat> and thanks for your uh, nice introduction of your talk. Into I think it really dovetails into mine in showing that what uh, there's a lot of really good new information on the long-term ecology or the historical ecology of marine systems. And this work is highlighting the importance of time series analysis, both in understanding ecological processes, but also in understanding habitat degradation over time. So even on the Great Barrier Reef, as Terry showed, there's abundant information about the environmental history and its history of degradation. But most of this information, while it's very interesting and informative, has not really been, taking up, been taken up in management approaches in marine settings, whereas it has in many terrestrial settings. So I think it should be taken up more, and I want to give you some information today um, that addresses the utility and the application of historical information into the management of reef ecosystems. Now, human impacts on marine ecosystems are large and pervasive. They've been far greater, they're far greater than imagined, than previously imagined, and they've occurred over much longer time scales than people are, are, are used to um, dealing with. Here's an example from Lotzi and Worm's uh, work summarizing the decline of large marine animals, uh, animal populations from their historical baselines. Um, pick your organism, you'll, you'll find one in there. There's been uh, dramatic uh, declines in uh, many of these uh, fish populations. Now, um, a, a consistent theme pervading many management situations is basically a temporal myopia in the way that we observe and manage um, ecosystems. And I think probably the best or the, the most well-known um, manifestation of this, of this temporal myopia is the shifting baseline syndrome. And that's where scientists, managers, and other stakeholders set inappropriate management goals based on their own short-term experience of an environment that was degraded long before their time. So the concept of shifting baselines, however, is a subset of a broader problem and that there's a fundamental mismatch between the temporal scales of observation and management and those of environmental and ecological change. The mismatch occurs because there's a lot of important ecological processes in the sea, as well as their environmental and anthropogenic drivers, that operate on much longer time scales than the best long-term research programs. Limited time scales have a lot of implications. We, we're managing without context. We have no ability to detect chronic and cumulative impacts. We're uncertain in attributing ecological change to human or natural agency. It also encourages an equilibrium view of ecosystem dynamics. Well, that's the state it is, or that's the state it's going to be. And there's difficulty in setting management goals and assessing the effectiveness of management actions. And I'll speak more to this in a few minutes. In short, we've, basic, we've massively underestimated, ignored, or been unaware of environmental, ecological, and anthropogenic, anthropogenic change over long time periods. And this is where the field of marine historical ecology comes in looking at environmental and ecological dynamics and their drivers over a series of nested temporal scales spanning years to millennia. Well, here's some nice historical photographs, some more nice historical photographs that demonstrate the, the, the kind of fishing day you might have had in 1957 off the Florida Keys uh, with a photograph on the left and the kind of day out fishing you would have today or a couple of years ago, a very different sort of um, uh, world that we live in. Um, as another example, there was a film, Empty Oceans, Empty Nets, a few years ago in which uh, there was an interview with Linda Greenlaw, who wrote a book called Hungry o The Hungry Ocean. And she was the skipper of a swordfish um, um, boat. And she was jacking up against the, um, the swordfish boycotts by, sh boycotts by chefs 
and other um, other um, parts of the of the community that you know she's saying that the oceans are in good shape look I go out there I make a good living I can make a lot of money I catch all sorts of swordfish 150 pound uh, swordfish uh, what's the problem and uh, the problem is that if she had done her fishing three decades ago those same 150 pound fish would have been 300 pounds or even five and six hundred pounds so uh, it's very difficult to um, for policymakers to 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 deal with this because they've got the industry saying to them, "Well, look, everything's viable, things are okay. Uh, what what are what are the managers and the environmental policy people supposed to supposed to do with that kind of um, reaction?" So this shifting of baselines is something that needs to be considered, and it's something that I hope we can address um, in our work on the on the reef as well. Uh, another quick example is the Atlantic cod. The historical range of variability showing uh, incredible amounts of biomass, six, 8,000 um, tons times 1,000. And you come down to the uh, 1970s to the year 2000, and you're basically just looking at small blips uh, in an otherwise functionally extinct um, uh, fishery. And you can imagine that uh, managers would have been uh, elated as the fish stocks went up and then uh, alternatively depressed as they went down. But really, they're way down here in the, uh, they're just managing uh, noise of a, of a potentially, uh, essentially functionally extinct uh, fishery. So we have to guard against this. And the only way to guard against it is by extending our analyses into the past. Uh, we've seen this picture. I don't have to say much uh, more about it other than if you were to uh, drive a car uh, along the coast from Cairns to Townsville or even further uh, in the 1900s, if you could have, um, you, would, you would have seen the beautiful reefs that are illustrated uh, just here. As we drive our cars along that same coastline today, we take for granted that, no, there's no way that reefs could live out there. It's too muddy. It's too, it's too close to the shore. And in our minds, we think, yeah, reefs never existed out there, but indeed they did. So I'm going to give you a little uh, a story today about uh, a, a small part of a broader research program on the history of coral communities on the inshore Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we've been taking cores up and down the reef of sediments, not, not corals, as Malcolm has done. But, um, and I'm going to concentrate on a study uh, in, um, that we've done in Townsville, which comprises a PhD uh, thesis of mostly one of my PhD students, uh, Jez Roth, but also with the uh, assistance and uh, PhD thesis of Claire Raymond as well in my lab. Uh, they've been working in the Palm Islands. I'm going to show you the, um, uh, some results from uh, Polaris Island. And what I'm going to do is look at relative abundance of coral genera uh, from three sites on Polaris Island, a north site, a beach site, and, uh, and a south site. The north site and the south sites have uh, sort of looked like the top uh, and the bottom photos, lots of dead acropora rubble. The beach site has a high cover of uh, pavona, of living pavona. Um, but what you can do is you can, you can compare the surveys of the modern corals and the, and the dead corals that are adjacent to it. We call those uh, death assemblages. And when you do that, you find that um, the Acropora dominates the um, death assemblages at both the north and the south sites. Uh, this is the Acropora. The, the dark is the death assemblage at the south site. And the dark <coughs> over here is Acropora. Uh, at the north side, and you can see it dominated the death assemblages, whereas the assemblages are very different. The life assemblages are very different. Uh, Pavona dominates both the life, uh, well, is the highest abundance coral at both the life and the death assemblages in the beach site, but the death assemblages have a lot of Acropora uh, in them as well. So basically, there's a fundamental difference in the community structure between what's living there now and what used to live there before. So two questions come up immediately to that, especially uh, in terms of management, and that is, when did this transition take place? Can we date it? And if we can, or, and the second question is, has this transition occurred before? Is it precedented, or is this just some part of a natural uh, cycle? So let's go to the first question. When did this uh, transition take place? Um, there's uh, radiometric age dating methods now that are very sophisticated that provide us with high-resolution 
um, dates for, um, for things way back in the geological past, but also very young. So we collect the corals, we clean them up, we put them into a mass spectrometer, we measure their uranium thorium um, radioisotopes, and we can date very, very young corals. Um, see this particular specimen that we, that we sampled um, ranges from 1986 to 1997. So um, it's a really nice feature for trying to understand uh, the, the mortality, or at least the length of time, that's represented by the life of these coral colonies. Okay, now when you do that to the death assemblages, the, these are the corals that are dead on top of the seafloor, we find um, some interesting uh, patterns in that uh, both the north site and the south site, acroporids date to the early to mid 20th century. There's two peaks. The blue is around 19, the late 1930s. The red in the north site is around the, the late 1940s. And the... These ages, the fact that we don't get any younger Acropora in these sites, suggests a lack of recovery of these Acropora populations since the mid-20th century at Polaris Reef. Now, at the beach site, there's, which is dominated by Pavona, we get a very different structure in the green here, age structure to those populations. There's a continuous um, spread of dates from about the 1980s to about 2005, and, accept, and it suggests a, a rather stable um, turnover of Pavona communities. So there appears to be a transition from about the 1950s from an Acropora-dominated assemblage to a Pavona-dominated uh, community. Okay, so there's this transition. We've got, we've got something different now than we had before. We can date it. But isn't this just a natural thing? Can't, hasn't this sort of flip-flop occurred in the past? Well, to address that, we go to the fossil assemblage. We core through the, uh, the reef sediment. This is how we do it. We bring a five-meter aluminum core down to the, to the sea floor. We get several divers to, um, to sort of orient the core. We pound it in uh, using two divers to pound the, uh, the, the, the core through the sediment. When we're done with that, we cap the top of the core. We uh, get some lift bags and some very strong people and basically extract the core uh, out of the sediment, cap the bottom as soon as we can after it comes out, and then uh, we send the core up to the boat and la -di da we've got a record of the uh, coral reef over a particular period of time. Now, the excellent preservation of the corals that are found within these cores allows attribution of genus and even species level taxonomy. The results I'm gonna show you today are gonna be at the genus level. So here's what happens in the cores. The, um, again, the north uh, site and the south site are shown on the left-hand side, the beach side on the right. The north site and the south site show very similar patterns. The red um, in the cores is the genus Acropora. And through all of these cores uh, at both sites, we see that the, that the reef was dominated by Acropora during the whole time. Some of these ages here, 1573, 1627, 1562. These are calendar years or years uh, AD. Um, our records go back to 842 uh, AD, so about a, a, about a 1200 year record maximum here of dominance of Acropora through these cores. If you go to the beach site, we find, again, uh, you start off with Acropora dominance, but then there's a shift to the, from the red to the blue at the top of the cores, and the blue is Pavona. And if you date the oldest um, Acroporas at that transition, you find strikingly similar ages to what we found in the death assemblages, late 1930s, late 1940s. So this transition that we dated in the death assemblages is also... Um, present in the fossil assemblages, and it is without precedent. Okay. So this is an unprecedented shift in the coral community dominance. Um, represents a significant decline in branching corals, and it postdated human settlement, and predated uh, much of the recent climate change, not all of it, and increase in things like disease and other things. 
Okay, so I want to get now to the, uh, the management implications of this, this kind of work, and I'm going to explore three implications for you. One is the documentation of a shifted baseline. The other is constraining the drivers of change. And the third is assisting in setting goals for successful management. Now, I think we can say quite um, convincingly that the present-day coral communities on Polaris Reef are not a useful baseline for future management because they have already been severely degraded. So we're not here in happy land. We're somewhere here down in degraded land. And we cannot attempt to manage our reefs um, you know, in thinking that this is the state that we need to have them in when we know that they used to be in far better shape. So without the collection and incorporation of historical data, we're all vulnerable to this shifting baseline syndrome. And often today, management decisions are, are, are informed by degraded um, states and not these historical uh, baselines. And hence, they fail to maintain healthy and productive ecosystems. The second implication is that this sort of work, with this sort of work, we're able to constrain the drivers of change. Human exploitation and changes in water quality have had measurable effects on the inshore GBR reef coral communities. Malcolm went through the physical aspects behind that. These are the biological and ecological repercussions. Um, these sorts of things have occurred in the absence of later stressors, such as bleaching, disease, and acidification. So if you want to draw a simple diagram of, Europe, of the Great Barrier Reef, European colonization then and an altered GBR. Now, what things uh, look like. We can set up a, a timeline of, um, of factors that are influencing, very important factors that are influencing the GBR. And if we look at the 1950s or 30s to 50s, we'd be somewhere around here where fishing water quality and habitat destruction had, had been the most important factors um, in, in, the, in the degradation of the GBR. So once the drivers of negative ecosystem change have been identified, then it's incumbent upon management to actually utilize the means to reverse the trajectories of decline based on the knowledge of what those drivers were. So the re recommendation here would be, since the drivers of a cropper decline predate the climate disease acidification on the nearshore GBR reefs, we want to regulate fishing, we want to enhance water quality, we want to stop habitat destruction as top priorities. Now, this isn't really earth-shattering news, but what it means is that marine historical ecology adds significant empirical weight to a sound management approach. And this is what we have to, as Terry mentioned, we have to keep hammering to the people who are making these decisions that this is a sound management approach. And I think historical ecology helps us out enormously in that regard. Now, the last uh, implication that I'd like to go through with you is that a dynamic view of an ecosystem assists in setting goals for successful management. What should our goals be? Our restoration goals can be set in the context of an historical range of variation. Now, we're not advocating that we, we sort of go back to some Garden of Eden or that we really can get back to what we, where we once were. I think we learned both uh, ecologically and socially, politically, and financially that that is not possible. But what we can do is we can set goals within the context of what we know has occurred in the past. Now, once these management actions have been set in place, historical studies of ecosystem dynamics provide a measure of how successful actions have been. So we've got a scale. We've got a ruler. We can say managers will take a particular action and predict an outcome, and we've got a historical context that we can use to measure the success of that outcome, the success of that particular goal. So this argues for a goal-oriented management approach where each and every outcome, sorry, each and every action has a predicted outcome. And lastly, we can um, manage for a dynamic system and use goals that are informed by this historical range of variability. And for inshore reefs, we want, we want management actions that can be taken that will facilitate processes that enable or can enable a crop or dominated communities to return. And the big question is, what are those and how can we uh, implement them? 
My last slide, the, the uh, take-home messages are from this work. We need to incorporate history into environmental assessments. This is going to enhance management decisions and help minimize this shifting baseline syndrome. Uh, we, understanding long-term history of populations, communities, species, and ecosystems constrains the drivers of ecosystem change, which help to target the most appropriate management actions, which of course are going to vary from place to place. And study of the historical range of variability provides fund a fundamental basis for setting goals and for successful management and also for assessing how successful management actions are. Thank you very much.